Come on, time to leave. Now? What's wrong? Is something following us? We have to go. We don't have any time to waste. Go? Where? Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. That's it. Umbrella's going down. I'm sorry, Claire, but it's not over yet. There's still something we've got to do. You mean... Yeah! It's payback time. We've got to destroy Umbrella. Now! Six years have passed since that horrendous incident. During the development of Resident Evil, Code Veronica, the spin-off game, Survivor, and another side game simply known as 1.9, another Resident Evil title had just started development. Resident Evil 3. Originally directed by Hideki Kamiya, this RE3 began its life as a mainline entry, taking place on a ship stranded at sea. The main character would be hung from RE2, just after his Raccoon City escape. This RE3's development didn't last very long, and instead that 1.9 game would become what we all know as Resident Evil 3, Nemesis. Kamiya's team and the game they had been working on was now Resident Evil 4, which would shift to being developed for the upcoming PlayStation 2 console. Director Kamiya's vision for the future of Resident Evil would take a bold new direction. With a lot of encouragement from series producer Shinji Mikami, RE4 would lean more into action than previous titles. A very stylish type of action. With Kamiya's basic idea of creating a horror-themed action game starring a cool and confident protagonist, RE2 writer Noburo Sugimura would step in to create the characters and story for Kamiya's thrilling new adventure. This title's story followed brand new character, Tony, a seemingly invincible man with superhuman abilities. After reviewing Kamiya's progress on this new survival horror game, Mikami thought what Kamiya was making strayed too far off the mark for what Resident Evil should be. He didn't think this stylish action game was bad, therefore deciding, maybe this should be its own series. With one RE4 concept completely rebooted as Devil May Cry, RE4 would get reworked multiple times before finally landing on an idea that would get the definitive green light from Mikami. With the majority of PlayStation and Sega-related titles being released, RE4's development would begin anew in 2001. At this time, one of Capcom's goals was moving the RE franchise to Nintendo's GameCube. Along Along with this exclusivity deal, Capcom's production Studio 4 would also develop four other original titles for GameCube. Those games were Dead Phoenix, Beautiful Joe, PN3, and the legendary gaming masterpiece, Killer. 7. After the release of Resident Evil Remake, RE4 would finally show itself. In this version of the game, we'd see Leon S. Kennedy, one of the protagonists from RE2, infiltrating and investigating an ancient Umbrella-owned castle. In this game, Leon would eventually become infected with the progenitor virus, and as the game would progress, Leon's arm would mutate. Very intriguing, very dark, very survival horror. One year later at E3 2003, another trailer was shown. This time we got lots of gameplay to sink our curious teeth into. This five minute look into what Resident Evil 4 was shaping up into was nothing short of breathtaking. We got to see Leon exploring the castle. We get tons of supernatural elements that at first glance might seem real, but turn out to be hallucinations. Leon's also pursued by the absolutely chilling and relentless Hookman, a ghostly figure that stalks Leon through the castle, only taking damage from sources of light. All of this was presented from both a fixed camera perspective and an all-new combat camera system, that being over-the-shoulder aiming. For the first time ever in a mainline Resident Evil game, your character would be able to accurately shoot a target. Wonderful trailer aside, we'd also get a few story details that sounded quite peculiar. Alongside Leon Leon's castle investigation, deep underground, a young girl awakens. Accompanied by an enhanced B.O.W. dog, this girl would also have to find her way out of this forgotten castle. Hmm, a young girl in a castle with a dog as her only line of defense? Sounds really cool, almost too cool to be included in this RE title. This trailer, often referred to as RE 3.5, was also unfortunately scrapped. 
As you've probably figured out by now, the last story detail was completely adapted into its own game, Haunting Ground, one of my favorite survival horror video games. So far, RE4 has been one of the most generous video games of all time, handing out ideas and creating full games off of its discarded concepts. Sadly, it was also one of the most difficult and troubling games to make. Co-writer to Sugimura, Yasuhisa Kawamura, revealed that at this point in RE4's life, the game's budget was spiraling out of control. While he and Sugimura were hard at work at refining RE4's story and characters, the scope and ambition of this title's gameplay and presentation was growing far too large for what Capcom was expecting. Featuring state-of-the-art 3D graphics, multiple camera systems, those being fixed, over-the-shoulder and first-person, the vision of this title was all over the place. Couple all of that with half the dev team feeling generally burnt out on the classic Resident Evil formula, it was inevitably decided that RE4 would be going in a new direction once again. Stepping into direct, Shinji Mikami would bring his uncompromised vision and game design expertise to the forefront of Resident Evil once more. It's kind of unfortunate because Kawamura has gone on the record with being pretty upset about 3.5 never seeing the light of day. That original concept and trailer are still very popular. Popular. Tons of fans genuinely want that trailer to be a full game, so much so that multiple fan revival games have started development to try and recapture that game's vision. Now, I know this might sound crazy looking back on them, but I distinctly remember around RE0's release, a lot of people in the gaming press were starting to get fed up with the basic survival horror mold that this series was going for since 1996. I even remember in school, a lot of kids I would talk to were also done with Resident Evil's gameplay. The classic RE series are all games that are rightfully looked back on very fondly, but if you asked the average game fan what they thought about RE at the time, they'd most likely tell you that they wanted something new. I remember even around Remake's release, people were saying similar things, which, of course, I never held any of those beliefs, but I was also open-minded to changes as well. It's so crazy looking back on this game's release. I remember seeing all of that 3.5 stuff back in the day and thinking it was the perfect evolution of the Resident Evil series at that time. But believe it or not, I wasn't really feeling all of the supernatural stuff, despite how cool it looked back then. By the way, I think it's awesome now. The last time I would ever see Resident Evil 4 before eventually playing it day one was in an issue of Game Informer magazine with this giant cover photo of Leon. That image is just burnt into my memory for all time. It was such a monumental occasion because the game kind of disappeared for a while and just seeing it again, I was like, oh yeah, Resident Evil 4, like I can't wait to play it. It's my favorite series. On January 11th, 2005, I stepped into a mom and pop electronics store on Fifth Avenue in Brooklyn, New York after just getting my first paycheck for my very first real soul crushing job. That being babysitting rich kids on Seventh Avenue. I slapped my money down on the counter Got this here, very same copy of Resident Evil 4, went home, started playing the game, and had my life changed forever. But before I tell you what happened next, I can't just be my regular old self for a Resident Evil retrospective. No, this is a special occasion. So let me change into something a little more appropriate. Ah, that's better. What, you didn't really think I was gonna wear that dress for this video, did you? No, I need something to secure the ballistics. I gotta take this. I actually ignored this guy in my last Resident Evil video. Hello? Is this Susie Sphere Hunter? Hey, John. Super Eye Patch Wolf. You're the anime man, right? No, that's, um, that's someone else. You, Susie, have fucked with me for the last time! Wait, 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 wait. What did I do? Ori 4? Ori 4? The game that changed everything? Final Fantasy 7 changed everything, not Ori 4! Yeah, but like every modern shooter uses the over-the-shoulder camera now. Delete the video right now! No, I'm not deleting the video, dude. Fine. I'm taking... Anyway, now that we've got all that dev history out of the way, let's take a deep bite out of Resident Evil 4. Or... 4... Resident Evil. <laughs>
Resident Evil 4 takes place six years after the Raccoon City saga. Leon Kennedy returns to the series, now as a specially trained and highly capable US government agent. Leon's currently investigating a small part of Europe looking for his president's missing daughter, Ashley Graham, who was abducted while returning home from college. Accompanied by a police escort, Leon arrives at his destination and is filled in from his mission dispatcher, Ingrid Hunnigan, who's quite the looker. I like the glasses. With the path to the nearby town blocked off by someone's truck, Leon decides to take his chances and enter a suspicious house. The door's wide open. I wonder if anyone's home. Uh, excuse me. Sir? I was wondering if you might recognize a girl in this photograph. ¿Qué carajo estás haciendo aquí? Lárgate, cabrón! <sighs> Sorry to have bothered you. Freeze! I said freeze! Looks like he isn't giving us any choice. We have to defend ourselves. In a flash, gunfire can be heard outside. Leon is surrounded, and his police escort has been driven off the village's cliffside entrance. These very human-looking men aren't zombies, but they sure do act rather brainless. With no other options, we lock and load and stylishly exit the house. RE4's basic shooting combat is levels of polish not seen in any video game that came before it. The over-the-shoulder aiming mode quickly snaps in behind Leon, opening your camera's view to whatever's in front of you. Aiming is literally laser accurate. Firing at specific enemy limbs provides a variety of results. Shoot a runner and they'll topple over. Cap someone in the arm and they'll drop their weapon. Graze a dude's head or knee and that'll stun them, opening them up for a devastating but satisfying melee counter. After this intense 1v3, we gather up some dropped enemy items, ammo and money. Interesting. Before heading into town, Leon checks on the police transport. Oh, no. Looks like there aren't any survivors. With the path cleared, we can finally proceed to the village. On our way, we find a very familiar looking dog. We free it from the bear trap it's stuck in. And yeah, not only is it very nice that we get to do this, but it also comes as a warning of a very low to the ground threat. The villagers have also set up a few explosive tripwires for oblivious tourists. Ah. <laughs> You see what I mean? Getting to the village proper, Leon scopes out the area, spotting one of the police officers he came here with. He's staked on fire right in the center of town. None of the villagers seem phased by this. Since it might not be the best idea to take the entire village head on, we sneak around the side passage, exploring one of the houses. These villagers look like normal people, but judging by what we've seen so far and how they've been living, in utter filth and disarray, something is very wrong here. This stealth mission doesn't last long, as we're spotted in minutes. As the village collapses in on Leon, we make our way into another very open house. Why these people? Okay, so at this point, I'm thinking these very brain dead individuals aren't as dumb as we originally thought. I'm just thinking back to all the clearly visible people hiding in the brush, running back to report to the main village. These guys might have a few tricks up their sleeve for old Leon Scott. This village raid is extremely intense. The house you start in gets completely surrounded, and while you can barricade the multiple exits, they won't stay like that for long, especially when a chainsaw is involved. 
On the second floor of the house, Leon finds a grenade, ammo, and a beautiful shotgun. There are a few other houses you can hunker down in while running for your life, but it's not smart to stay in one location for too long. Your cover might end up becoming a pigeonhole. I love this scenario because while it might seem disorienting at first, walking into ambushes while learning a new camera and slightly updated control scheme, you can use your surroundings against these guys in a lot of ways. See a sturdy looking door frame? Well, bottleneck those villagers with your newly acquired shotgun. See a ladder with two or three guys climbing it? Push that thing down. Keep them at bay. The enemies in this game are really aggressive and use their own tactics against you, but as long as you're giving them that same energy right back, you can get through this. It's such a frantic, amazingly designed encounter that not only sets up this game's on-the-fly, backs-against-the-wall gameplay, but it's also really intense for a Resident Evil game. There was nothing like this in the titles that came before. When zombies began to gather up, it was easy to bypass them with a shotgun or grenade launcher. Due to those games being on weaker hardware, there weren't a ton of zombies in a horde all at once. Here, what seems like a very human threat is constantly keeping you on your toes, with large groups of enemies that you have to act fight to keep away from you. It's an unpredictable enemy type that will exploit your weaknesses as well as attack you in great numbers. There's no holding back for these villagers. With all of that said, a bell can be heard ringing out in the distance. Oh, la campana. Es hora de rezar. Tenemos que irnos. Where's everyone going? Bingo? RE4 has probably the strongest opening for any action game. Right away the game is like, this ain't your pappy's Resident Evil. This is a new breed of high-octane action horror. The over-the-shoulder camera was obviously revolutionary. Almost every third-person shooter 17 years on is still using this camera system. I know we've been dealing with it for quite a while now, but this was monumental. Going from games that all basically looked like this, to RE4's laser-accurate, free-aiming style. It might be the most substantial gameplay upgrade for a particular established 3D game series. The previous main and side Resident Evil titles all use the light lock-on paired with fixed camera perspectives. Well, except for Survivor. It was a huge risk taking such a drastic creative change in an established series like this, but it absolutely opened up a world of possibilities within every aspect of the game's combat. It totally worked in Capcom's favor. They literally created the blueprint for every action shooter to follow. So yeah, as you saw in the introduction, RE4 isn't exactly going for classic survival horror. This is a frantic style of play with enemies that aren't afraid to get in your face whether you're ready for them or not. RE4 still uses the same tank controls and button layout that you'd find in its predecessor titles, but free aiming offers a whole new level of control and capability. While Leon has free reign over where he can shoot enemies, he still can't move while aiming, which is a staple of Resident Evil of course. I honestly think it wouldn't be good for this game. It would make combat encounters far too easy, being able to shoot while moving. We'll talk more about this in a second. Leon is a bit more mobile now in general, being able to vault over small obstacles and jump from large heights. This adds a layer of tension to fights. You're not just running away anymore, now you're clearing obstacles and frantically jumping out of windows. It's really exciting. RE4 is the first mainline game to have a heads-up display. You can see context-sensitive actions like vaulting, picking up items, and your HP and ammo. This is a massive change from the norm, but it's all in service to the game's new fast-paced direction. You might be wondering, with the level of control gained in aiming and basic movement, can you control the camera outside of combat? Why, yes you can, but it only works like how you'd actually look around in real life. Camera control is mapped to the C-Stick. You can look up, 
down, left or right, just like a real human would. If you want to see what's behind Leon, you have to physically turn around, using a classic 180 quick turn. Whenever I play this game, I often check my corners when surrounded in battles. Survival aside, you can use this look system to just admire the amazing scenery. This game is visually impressive for a GameCube title, taking place in a fully 3D game world. With that in mind, lots of doors just open in this game. RE4's environments are mostly connected zones, which means you'll be exploring quite a bit before hitting a load screen. Gone are the days of beautifully rendered door-opening loading screens. We don't have time for that! Five angry villagers are chasing me, I gotta kick this door open! You can still find healing items like before, but this time Leon will be finding new yellow herbs, which when combined with green herbs, increases his max vitality, which is very RPG of this RE. The poison status has been removed, which means no more blue herbs, which is unfortunate because because I love looking at those mystical plants. Like I mentioned in the intro, most enemies drop items now. Some of these are ammo and healing, but the interesting new addition is money. In the game's second chapter, we're introduced to a fabulous gentleman simply known as the Merchant. Got something that might interest you. <laughs> This guy can be found all over the game. He's got multiple shops set up in a variety of locations. His services include selling you items, weapons, upgrading said weapons, and buying stuff from Leon. Did I mention you can also find a lot of treasure hidden in the game world? As a veteran sphere hunter, I always have a lot of fun searching for these rare collectibles. Some treasures can even be combined with others and sold for way more cash. I absolutely love the treasure system in this game. Every single collectible is lovingly detailed, from the countless Spinel crystals to all the gothic antiques you'll be finding and putting back together. It's so much fun spotting this stuff in the environment, collecting them, and then marveling at their shininess. Am I the only one that does that? You know, describing this game out loud, it really doesn't feel like I'm talking about Resident Evil, but here we are. RE4 isn't a survival horror game. It's a horror-themed action-adventure title. Listen to these item pickup sounds. Those are RPG sounds if I've ever heard any. The inventory screen is still here, but this time it's its own mini-game. Inventory is strictly for your resources now. Treasures and key items get their own separate screens. Sorting all of your things poses its own challenge. Since shooting is the core of this game, your ammo and weapons tend to pile up, creating a lot of clutter. Managing all of it while also holding onto heals and keeping your guns perfectly aligned is invaluable. So the classic Resident Evil feeling of, oh, I have no space to pick this thing up, still occasionally rears its ugly head to halt your progress. While on the subject of space management, ink ribbons are no longer a thing, so saving at a typewriter is infinite now, which, yes, removes any penalty of death, but again, this being an action game, it's a change that works in RE4's favor. In previous entries, spacing and combat played a huge role in how you dealt with threats, whether that be creating enough distance between you and your adversary with weapon attacks, or carefully setting up an enemy animation to slip by them. In RE4, those things are still present, but now with the added aforementioned body awareness the villagers have, there are a plethora of body part reactions you can take advantage of. To go into it a bit more, if you had full control over Leon's movement while shooting, it would erase most of the challenge that comes with getting to a certain position, setting up a group of villagers in the right way, and using screen-clearing means like shotguns, grenades, or melee counters. Your immediate spacing and position plays a massive role in achieving skillful play. Battles are overall way more dynamic now because of these factors. In a game like RE2, or remake, you can shoot out a zombie's legs, forcing them to crawl. In RE4, that kind of thing is way deeper and applies to all of your defensive options. One of those options being melee combat. It's been completely reworked for RE4. Unlike the previous entries where your knife was treated as its own weapon, taking up inventory, now Leon's knife is permanently equipped and readied by holding down the L button. You can do a lot with your knife, like slashing your enemies and smashing open item crates, saving ammo. When an enemy is on the ground, you can knife them instead of spending ammo. Like I mentioned before, Leon also has a variety of context-sensitive melee counters after he stuns an enemy. The roundhouse kick is incredible. It hits almost everything around Leon, sending whatever foolish foes caught in its radius flying. Dropping an adversary on their knee opens them up for a front kick, which does more damage but only hits whatever's in front of Leon. For how amazing the roundhouse and front kicks are, there's something even more legendary Leon can do. And that's the suplex. Ah. 
I never thought I'd be saying this, but taking these rural freaks to Suplex City works so well. Leon is apparently so strong, he can headshot crit enemies with kicks and suplexes. What the hell, man? Melee is just the icing on the cake for RE4's combat. The real meat of this game's battle system are its firearms. And holy crap, these guns are sick. The arsenal of weapons this title offers is huge. Five pistols, three shotguns, two sniper rifles, two machine guns, and a collection of special weapons like single-use rocket launchers and the mine thrower from RE3 makes its return. Fun fact, RE4 has not one, not two, but three magnum firearms. One of those I have right here. The killer... <laughs> the killer... Se <laughs> I'm sorry, my head hurts every time I try to say this gun's name out loud. I swear, this thing is cursed. Killer 7. They're almost here. I've got one hell of a surprise for them. I changed my makeup. Did you notice? <laughs> Men. They never notice. These kinds of things. Shit. Fuck it. Every weapon has a plethora of upgrades that really change up how they function. Damage output, rate of fire, reload speed, the amount of rounds a weapon holds, and a special exclusive upgrade that grants specific guns a super ability. This makes you feel stronger as you progress, but also adds an identity to each and every firearm. The upgrade system rewards your loyalty to particular guns. You can totally swap out to new pieces as you get through the story, but if you choose to settle down with Leon's starting handgun, for example, that thing will become quite the killing machine before credits roll. This is how I usually play my fresh save files in RE4, and that example is just one of many. The mine thrower gets heat-seeking mines when fully upgraded. I'm not kidding when I say by the end of this game, each piece of iron in your inventory will stand on its own and have a tangible place in combat. Functionality aside, the way Leon's tools of destruction look and sound are perfect. One of the goals when developing this game was to make the guns completely unique. But I think Capcom went full god mode when designing these beautiful life enders. Every, and I mean every gun in this game, is memorable. It makes sense that this area of the game would get a lot of attention, because shooting is mostly what you're doing. All of the guns have their own fan bases. There are arguments pretty regularly about which of the five pistols is the best. It's always Red 9 versus Blacktail, but I'll have you know that Leon's starting Silver Ghost is the best. That Frankenstein's monster of a mishmash gun is like the coolest video game pistol ever made. No one ever brings up the Punisher, though. That thing's laser-like sound emphasizes its unique piercing power. It's so cool how they gave this gun a sound based on how it performs in gameplay. It's also pleasing to the ear. For real, look at the rifle's reload animation. Is that not like the most satisfying thing on the planet? Now look at it upgraded. There are different animations when you max out a gun's reload speed. This is what I meant by God Mode Capcom. People hate on the TMP, but that little bastard is useful for basically every situation. It runs, it guns, and it flippin' stuns. Seriously, the TMP is super underrated. The first two shotguns might perform similarly, but did you know that Leon actually handles the riot gun faster than the starter shotgun? I just found this out recently, and I thought it was super cool. Am I gonna talk about RE4's guns all day? No, but I did want to shout out my friend's channel, Kendo Gun Shop. The Kendo brothers, Robert and Joseph, are back with their own YouTube channel, where they break down and discuss weapons from Resident Evil. Their video production value and general knowledge of firearms and what inspired the guns of Resident Evil is so much fun to see explained. Please check them out, their channel is severely underrated. You won't regret it. With such amazingly crafted firearms, we need to talk about who you'll be using them against. The other monumental change to RE4 is the game's enemies. The very human, Ganados. These people are all super strong, hive mind alike individuals that are able to throw Leon around with little effort and can shake off gunshots straight to the face. 
The Ganados are a religious community split into three factions, the first being common townsfolk we've met in the village. I'm gonna save the other two for later, but yeah, the Ganados are one hell of a challenge compared to the zombies of days gone by. Ganados use a lot of different weapons like gardening tools, medieval crossbows, and morning stars, and some modern tech that'll really keep you on your toes. Like we discussed before, the Ganados pose a very forward threat to Leon, oftentimes rushing him directly, but they can also be quite sneaky. Ambushes and flanking happens a lot in some of the larger battles, forcing you to be aware of your surroundings at all times. These guys can just chuck their weapons at you if they feel like, and the way they almost stagger out of the way of your gun's laser sight makes them feel smart, like they're actively trying to avoid taking damage. While I don't really find Ganados scary, they're always really intense to deal with. You feel that backs against the wall vibe when fighting these guys in the early game. Actually, I lied. The scariest Ganados are the Chainsaw Wielders, Dr. Salvador and his assistant, and the Bella Sisters. The way these jerks scream bloody murder right as they go for Leon's neck with their saws blasting off the decibel charts always makes my heart skip a beat. I probably shouldn't say this, but Chainsaws kinda scare me. Whoever invented them should be put in jail forever. When I was younger, I may have watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre when I wasn't supposed to. Maybe after that fateful night, I may have been looking over my shoulder for about a week, expecting some big idiot with a saw to be right behind me. When I went up against Dr. Salvador the first time, and this happened... <laughs> My entire world was rocked. Seeing such a gruesomely detailed death scene happen to one of my favorite characters, it really shook me. Gore on the main characters has always been a thing in previous RE titles, but those games aren't as visually stunning as RE4. This type of death scene hits really hard and is super effective at getting you to care for your character's well-being. Even as a younger sphere hunter, I immediately understood why the devs decided to do this, and it's to make you feel vulnerable as the player. Whenever combat is happening, you are in danger. At any moment, Leon can bite the dust hard. The basic villagers pack quite the punch when they land hits on Leon. Getting eviscerated isn't exclusive to them. You have to be careful too. Even though Leon's way more capable than he ever was, he's still very much a human being that can die at the drop of a hat. Dr. Salvador used to scare the absolute shit out of me. When I first played RE4 and I saw the Leon chainsaw death scene, I remember being so overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. I actually dropped my controller and covered my eyes with my hands. That's how freaked out I was by seeing Leon get decapitated. It was so fucked up. I couldn't, I couldn't handle it back then. It took me a while to get over my fear of chainsaws, but once I did, well, you can see what happened. It's a different story when you're the one with the chainsaw. There are tons of other enemies in RE4, including at least two handfuls of actual monsters, with their own insanely polished death scenes. But before we talk about that stuff, we have to pick up where we left off, back in the village. After Leon's very warm welcome, we get to explore this cold, mysterious town. Right away, we find a public notice, including information and pictures of Leon. The village's chief, a man named Betores Mendez, seems well aware of our leading man's mission in finding Ashley. The notice talks about Ashley being kept in an old house beyond the village square. There's also mention of a third party potentially tipping off Ashley's location to the US government. Whatever the circumstances, that old house is our first stop. Fighting our way past more angry people and collecting treasures, we come across a warning post that we've seen similar copies of at the village's entrance. Proceeding down this lonely pathway, a group of men above us push a massive boulder down behind us. Here we have another new mechanic, quick time events. Mash the button on screen fast or else... Like, I know this is totally ridiculous in retrospect, but gosh darn, this boulder run was so cool and unexpected back in the day. It plays into the idea that the villagers are on top of you at all times. You're a stranger on their turf. Outrunning the boulder, we finally make it to the old house. Now this place is heavily guarded. At the back of the house, we hear something rustling around in a closet. Could it be Ashley? <laughs> ah, a little rough, don't you think? This is Luis Serra, a resident of this village who seems relatively normal. Before Leon could get any info out of him, the village chief makes his grand entrance. The big cheese. What? <laughs> uh. 
After getting totally wrecked, Leon and Luis are taken to a cabin where a mysterious hooded man injects Leon with some kind of organism. Leon wakes up tied to Luis, and after shaking the charming Spaniard awake, Leon asks him a few questions. Whoever you are, name's Leon. Came here looking for this girl. Seen her? Okay, let me guess. She's the president's daughter? <laughs> That's too good for a guess. Wanna start explaining? Psychic powers. Nah, <laughs> just kidding with you, amigo. Luis is an ex-cop who clearly knows more than he's letting on. He fills Leon in on Ashley's location. She's being held in a church beyond the village. Before he can say anything else, a wounded Ganado tries cleaving the two in half. Caught up in the scuffle, Luis escapes, leaving Leon by himself. What follows are multiple, very well-designed action set pieces. One of the most memorable is Leon's battle through a canyon. This part really demonstrates how strong a lot of RE4's level design is. There's a lot of variety in how you can tackle fighting these particular enemies. Lots of verticality, tons of enemies on screen, two buildings to hide in, one with multiple entrances and exits, ladders, windows, doors. This part's got it all. It's a great taste of things to come as the player gets further into the story. After bypassing this valley, Leon finds himself in the village chief's house. Here we find a key to a locked house back in the village square. There's also a journal from the chief. This memo sheds light on our situation. Mendez brings up a Lord Sadler. Must be the top dog that we saw infecting Leon earlier. Mendez doesn't get why Sadler wants to keep Leon and Luis alive, but he still trusts in his lord's better judgment. Mention of a third party infiltrating the village comes up again. Mendez seems very convinced that someone else is helping Luis and leaking info to outsiders. No one else in the congregation believes this, however. After reading this note, the man himself jumps Leon. Almost squeezing the life out of our hero, Leon's eyes begin to change color. Mendez tells our distressed frontman that he carries the same blood as the villagers and lets him go. Leon, being the stubborn go-getter, pursues the chief but is caught off guard again. As Mendez crushes the life out of poor Leon, gunshots can be heard. As the chief faces the source of the gunfire, we get a glimpse at our third party. A woman in a red dress, somehow so familiar. Leon recovers and makes his way back to Town Square. As Leon enters the village's main house, something amazing happens. When I first got to this room and heard this track, I felt a genuine wave of relief wash over me. This is Serenity, one of RE4's save room themes. This track is not only one of my favorites in the entire series, but it was the first moment in this game where I paused and thought to myself, oh yeah, this is Resident Evil. I used to listen to this song on my CD player with a burnt disc that I had made of relaxing video game music. I used to sit on the steps of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan, New York listening to this track. It's a very heartwarming memory for me. And every time I play RE4 and get to this particular moment, I usually think back to those times when times were simpler. Uh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to go down memory lane. RE4 just does that to me. As we make our way under the house's secret walkway, we emerge into a graveyard with the village's church overlooking the scene. The church is well guarded and the doors are locked, of course with a very Resident Evil looking lock. The pathway leading outside of the village is suspended by a walkway above a large body of water. An ominous body of water. In one of the shacks on this path we find yet another notice from the village chief. It explains how Luis is now public enemy number one for stealing something very valuable to this cult. The note also confirms that Ashley is in fact in the church, but Mendez doesn't seem too bothered about Leon making any further progress. He brings up Leon having the same blood as the villagers again and is confident that he will join them. There's also mention of something called Del Lago being awoken in the lake. Continuing onward, we find ourselves in a massive arena of sorts, where very deep growling can be heard just beyond a giant set of doors. I'm sure it's nothing. Dodging another massive boulder and trekking through a swamp filled with ganados, Leon finds himself at the aforementioned lake. Peering into the water, we spot some men dumping the body of the other police officer we came into town with. 
The officer is gobbled up by a creature roughly the size of the Empire State Building. With no other options, Leon makes his way across the water in the ricketiest little boat I have ever seen. This is Del Lago. Del Lago's boss fight is extremely memorable. Armed with basically an infinite supply of harpoons, Leon has to chuck each of these spears at the creature while being pulled along the water. You still have control over the boat while Del Lago is dragging you around, but the monster's movements are so unpredictable. It can guide you right into debris littering the lake, or take you on a gentle ride just before going back under. If you happen to fall off the boat, you've got to mash the A button like your life depends on it. Del Lago is obviously a one-shot kill. I really love this set piece, but if I had to complain about one thing, it'd be the last of variety in fighting this guy on replays. Del Lago is a boss you fight the exact same way every time you play this game. Maybe if we were allowed to use our upgraded weapons against it when it surfaced, that would offer a more enjoyable experience. It's still a fantastic boss fight regardless, and it <laughs> totally plays on my fear of open bodies of water. I just wish it wasn't as on rails as it is. Defeating this Goliath, Leon begins coughing up blood, eventually passing out in a nearby cabin. As Leon awakens, he begins to mutate. Just a bad dream. I like this scene a lot because it's basically Leon having a nightmare about transforming into whatever these villagers are. What's perfect is right after Leon has this particular nightmare, we finally get an answer as to what's going on. These villagers are infected with a monstrous parasite that has the ability to erupt out of the body of its host when night falls. These creatures are sensitive to light, and that explains why none of them appeared earlier in the day. The eyes of infected hosts glow red, just like Leon's hours earlier. I always thought the parasitic enemies in this game were really effective because it had me very nervous that this same thing would happen to Leon if I wasn't careful enough. Exploring a nearby cave reveals a path back to the church, as well as the key to its lock. Getting back on track, we're greeted by a group of villagers unleashing that thing that was hidden behind those giant doors. Struggling to keep this creature in check, it finally appears, slaughtering the townsfolk. This monster is El Gigante, one of my favorite boss fights in RE4. The massive ogre has so many different ways he can attack. He can hit you with giant punches, kicks, ground slams, pick you up, use the environment, and full-on charge at Leon. After you've done enough damage, the giant's parasite erupts from its back. You can either shoot this thing or go Shadow of the Colossus on his ass, climbing the giant and taking your blade to the writhing creature. Hey, it's that dog. Look, guys. Huey's back. I wonder if this poor pup's PTSD kicked in seeing a human getting bullied by a giant ogre. Huey, being the best puppy in the world, helps distract this massive creature while you deal damage. Taking this giant out opens the path. Mysteriously, Huey vanishes after this battle. Unlike Del Lago, I really love this fight because it can play out in so many different ways. Want to take the giant out in style? Cut that parasite off its back. Want to play it safe? Keep your distance and shoot him. Want to stomp him out? Fire a frickin' rocket at him. Lots of depth, lots of fun. Making our way back to the church and heading inside, we finally meet Ashley. Ashley. Don't come! Hey, take it easy. No! Get away! Calm down. Everything's going to be just fine. My name's Leon. I'm under the president's order to rescue you. What? My father? That's right. With the target secured and a landing zone given to us by Hunnigan, we make our way out of the village, but not before running into Lord Sadler himself. My name is Osman Sadler, the master of this fine religious community. What do you want? To demonstrate to the whole world our astounding power, of course. Leon, I think they shot something in my neck. What did you do to her? We just planted her a little gift. 
Oh, there's going to be one hell of a party when she returns home to her loving father. <laughs> oh, I believe I forgot to tell you that we gave you the same gift. When I was unconscious. You will become my puppets. Involuntarily, you'll do as I say. I'll have total control over your minds. Don't you think this is a revolutionary way to promulgate one's faith? Sounds more like an alien invasion if you ask me. Leon and Ashley are infected with the same parasite the villagers happen to be carrying, that being Las Plagas. This simple investigation is now a race against the clock as the virus grows within our dashing duo. Leon and Ashley's escape will be tough now that she's around. The villagers won't make this easy for Leon. Whenever Ashley is with Leon, the game becomes an escort mission. Ashley is present in combat situations and can take damage. You can tell her to wait or follow you, or hide her in literal dumpsters. It's Really ridiculous to see, but you can totally do that. Whatever your choice, you'll have to be careful where you leave Ashley alone. The Ganados aren't out to kill her, but take her back to Sadler. If Ash is grabbed, you'll have to act fast before she's lost forever. On your first playthrough, this might get quite challenging, managing Leon's health, ammo, where the enemies are, and Ashley's status. Over the years, Ashley's become quite the meme in this regard. Her shrill screams for help and utter helplessness in combat have cemented her as quote unquote, one of the most annoying characters in existence. Now, I'm not sure if you've noticed this yet, but I'm quite the Ashley fan. It might be the most unpopular opinion that I hold for a variety of reasons. But I gotta say, I don't think Ashley's that bad. I'm not trying to brag or anything, but since day one, I never really had issues taking care of her. I always thought she was really cute, too. When I first played this game, I thought Leon was also really attractive, and Ashley kinda looks like me, so I was like, man, I wish I was in Ashley's shoes, having a hunk -o -matic like Leon Scott protecting her. Basically what I'm trying to say is, get good, scrubs. This game is easy. Taking care of Ashley adds tension and a layer of franticness to the game's combat. Her entire escort mission falls in line with the fast-paced gameplay. Oh, what's that? You think Ashley's got big, ugly ears? Dude, you're negging the president's daughter? Talk about a beta move. Anyway, after passing through the town square one final time, Leon gets a call from Hunnigan informing him that their chopper has been shot down. With the remaining villagers closing in, Leon and Ash take shelter in a nearby cabin, bumping into our old friend Luis. Well... I see that the president's equipped his daughter with ballistics, too. How rude! After that genuinely exquisite line of dialogue, Leon and Luis hold off the surrounding villagers in a very iconic set piece that would be replicated many more times throughout this series and in other video games. As the townsfolk back off, Luis disappears into the night. Before we can leave, we find another public notice from the chief. In it, Mendez expresses how he's underestimated Leon. He's sure what's coming up next will be the end of our leading man. If it isn't, he'll step in personally to finish the job. There's also mention of Mendez's sight being the key out of this village, whatever that means. Emerging victorious, our heroes are faced with a giant gate equipped with what looks like a modern day retinal scanner. Looks like we'll finally have to confront the big cheese. Finding an abandoned barn mentioned in Mendez's last note, Leon enters the building. Here he's intercepted by the man himself, but this time manages to blow up the biggest possible cheese with an explosive barrel revealing his true form. Gotta say, was not expecting anything like that. This fight is fantastic and multifaceted. There's some great verticality with the barn's second floor, but Leon can also be dragged down with Mendez's tentacles. Doing enough damage to the chief's spine breaks the mutated creature in half. From here, he swings around like a frickin' maniac. In this form, you're not safe anywhere standing still. I love just using a rocket launcher on him in this phase, blasting him into the stratosphere and ending the fight quickly. 
Because honestly, if you don't have flash grenades or the TMP, this fight can be admittedly kind of a slog. After finally taking out our head honcho, his eyeball falls out of his head. It's a false eye. Using it on the scanner gets us out of the village, but it's here where the nightmare truly begins. With nowhere to go and the remaining bulk of villagers hot on their trail, Leon and Ash take cover inside the village's ancient castle. Even though these castle walls might seem secure, the people inside them are much worse than the common townsfolk we've been fighting thus far. This is the second faction of Ganado, a cult by the name of Los Illuminados. The cultists are more zombie-like, droning forward, even muttering the word, brains. These cultists also have a few mutations of their own, like a full head-eating plaga and an acid-spitting spider. Disgusting. Getting into the castle, Leon and Ash meet up with Luis. He's brought our pair of viral suppressant drug. Oh wait, he dropped it. Uh, good one, Luis. I guess it's the thought that counts. Entering the castle proper, we hear sinister laughter. <laughs> Starting to wonder when you might notice us. Who are you? Me llamo Ramon Salazar, the eighth castellan of this magnificent architecture. I have been honored with a prodigious power from the great Lord Sadler. I've been expecting you, my brethren. No thanks, bro. My, my, we've got a feisty one. If you care for your own well-being, I suggest you surrender yourself and simply become our hostage. Or Mr. Scott, you can give us the girl because you're not worth a penny, I'm afraid. You can die. Yes, that was a demonic Napoleon cosplayer. From here on out, the game goes completely insane. Stepping into the castle leaves whatever semblance of reality at its doors. Salazar is the second villain of this title, who's also in charge of these castle cultists. So much happens in the castle that if I were to talk about everything, we'd be here for a week. If the village was Ganado-focused, the castle is definitely a bit more monster-focused, as you've seen with the new Plaga mutations. Don't get me wrong, there are still tons of cultists to blast in style, but almost immediately we're introduced to a Hugh Jackman Wolverine wannabe who's got a parasite sucking on his back. This is a Garador, a vision-impaired, incredibly powerful creature, who guards a switch, allowing access into the castle's annex. This guy is basically an upright licker. Leon's stealth PTSD is definitely kicking in when battling this thing. Garadors are kept alive by the parasites on their back, so the goal is to get behind them and shoot that thing until its host stops moving. Any loud noises Leon makes attracts the monster's attention, and believe me, you don't want to be caught making noise around this guy. Using parts of the environment and strategically running can alert the creature in ways that help you exploit its weak vision, giving you moments to land powerful shots on its parasite. Taking out the clawed beast, we enter RE4's most iconic room, Water Hall. This room sees cultists endlessly funneling in. Depending on how well you've been doing up to this point in the game, this room will either be more or less difficult. Adding in certain enemies like crossbow snipers and the rafters, or removing guys if you bite the dust too many times. The goal is to get to the door at the back of the room. To do this, you have to pass a wall of cultists, activate two switches, crank this one lever while guys are attacking you, dodge a few scythe-wielding psychos, boost Ashley up to this platform so she can crank two additional levers that raise platforms to escape the room while you cover her with sniper fire and also protect yourself from cultists on the ground. It's a lot, and many players struggle big time with this gauntlet of stress. I know I used to find this room extremely tough. On the harder difficulty, this room is always set to its hardest version. Dying a few times and rebalancing the room's difficulty cannot help you here. For as insane as it is, Waterhall is a genius design. It's kind of like a deciding factor if you're capable enough to keep playing. It tests everything you've learned up to this point with combat, spacing, and managing Ashley's well-being. I love and hate this room so much. Getting past this nightmare, Ashley has a Plaga-induced panic attack and is separated from Leon. Salazar is so crazy that he's installed special trap hallways that can perfectly ensnare people and take them to different rooms. Like, what kind of Cartoon Network bullshit is this? I love it. 
By the way, old Sal has hacked into Leon's personal communicator, so you'll be getting calls from him taunting you for the rest of your castle visit. Like I said, Cartoon Network. The next set piece sees Leon trudging through the dungeon of the castle. Here he's jumped by an invisible threat, the Novistadors. These acid-vomiting roaches from hell will melt your face right off. When I saw this when I was younger, the controller flew across the room. The definition of horror. It's an actual scary event surrounded by a myriad of comical castle shenanigans. This should go to show you how the castle is paced. You get an amazingly silly moment, like with Salazar's intro, then you're sneaking around Wolverine in a genuinely intense battle, then pull your hair out in Waterhall, and then are tortured mentally by invisible bugs. It's absolutely psychotic. By the way, right after that horrifying set piece, Leon has to dodge swinging pendulum axes. Like, what is going on? Who built all of this? It only gets sillier from here on out, trust me. The next series of antics comes after finding a journal from Salazar himself. This memo goes into the origins of Las Plagas and the Illuminados cult. Back in the day, an unknown ancestor of Salazar's saw what the cult was doing around the country, indoctrinating common folk with the use of the parasite that now infects everyone in this village. This unknown royal outlawed the practice of the cult's religion, sealing away Las Plagas deep under the castle. Fast forward to right now, one of the last members of the cult, Sadler, has somehow convinced Salazar to release the parasite and join him in his efforts of taking over the world. How can someone as old as Salazar be so easily convinced to join a cult and take a parasite into his own body willingly? If you don't need me, then get off my back, old man! <gasps> Did you say old man, Mr. Kennedy? It might come as a surprise, but I'm only 20 years old. Well, there's your answer. He's just a kid. Sadler clearly gave him a superior version of the parasite that seems to have aged him up quite considerably, while keeping most of his mental faculties in check. It's really cool piecing this story together. This crotchety, old, delusional man is taking advantage of Salazar's royal family and castle. It's pretty sad. Anyway, here's a Gatlin gun. Eventually, Leon finds himself outside of the castle, and after surviving a hedge maze of death, we finally find out who the mysterious third party is, and are reintroduced to a familiar face. Put your hands where I can see them. Bit of advice, try using knives next time. Works better for close encounters. Leon. Long time no see. Ada. So it is true. True? About what? You, working with Wesker. Why are you here? Why'd you show up like this? <laughs> See you around. Ada Wong Ada. is back. It's kind of a weird reaction for Leon to have after six years of thinking this woman was dead. The conversation these two have makes it seem like they've met before this moment. And while I think on closer inspection this should have been explored a lot more, I was still really excited and happy to see Ada return to the series. By the way, there's a shooting gallery minigame that unlocks special figurines of the characters. Ada is one of them. Like, this minigame can spoil Ada's reveal like an hour before it happens. Yes, back in 2005, this moment was spoiled for me, and I was so confused, until I saw the cutscene. So, good job, Capcom. Heading back into the castle, we meet up with Luis again, as this is happening. Luis gets totally impaled by Sadler's appendage. Gross. 
Sadler makes off with Luis's stolen Plaga sample. Luis finally lifts the curtain on who he is in his last moments. Stay with me, Luis. I am a researcher hired by Sadler. He found out what I was up to. <laughs> Don't talk. Here. It should suppress growth of the parasite. The sample. Sadler took it. You have to get it back. Lewis! Lewis! After this very depressing moment, Ashley wakes up. Help! That's right, Luis's death. All of that commotion was happening in the same room that Ashley was being held in. It's kind of funny. Freeing Ash from her binds and taking down a few cultists starts one of the standout moments of this game for me personally. It's Ashley's time to shine. The playable Ashley segment. What was a pretty flawless horror action adventure fest up until now returns to being a survival horror game for just a few moments. As Ashley, you have to avoid cultists while doing some light puzzle solving, hitting the cranks pretty hard, finding puzzle pieces, and doing a very difficult slide puzzle. Like I said, very difficult. Um, why does she need Leon's help again? Could she do that the whole time? A small detail about this section that I love so much is that we get to see a painting of an uninfected Salazar. This just shows you how young he really was before taking in the Plaga. Speaking of survival horror, if you play this part in the original Japanese version, the level actually uses fixed camera angles like the four previous Resident Evil games. For some godforsaken reason, this was removed from the US version. I can't imagine why. Keeping the original perspective would make for an amazing contrast of past and present. Leon's way more experienced in combat now, so having that very liberating over-the-shoulder view makes so much sense for him. He's gotten better at his job, and so have we as video game players. Having unfamiliar, disorienting fixed camera angles fits Ashley's very unexperienced and normal personality. She's not a fighter, and this design choice perfectly reflects what she's going through, being a scared, defenseless girl stuck in a castle. Regardless of how things play out in whatever version you're playing, this incredible gameplay scenario is short-lived, but a standout in my eyes. Leon! Ashley! <laughs> you did good. I'm sorry if I was... Oh, don't worry about it. Come on, let's move on. So as I mentioned before, a lot happens in the castle, so pardon me while I blitz through some of the less important stuff. Okay, Leon goes into a lava room, he fights fire-breathing dragons, somehow he doesn't melt instantly from standing in there, him and Ash take a literal roller coaster ride across the castle, twice, they almost get sandwiched by Sal, Ash gets stuck in a bloody hallway, a giant wooden excavator breaks through the wall, Leon shoots some heads off, Sal's bug takes Ash away, Leon fights two Garadors by shooting a wall with a rocket, killing them both instantly, Leon finally finds Ash but falls into a pit, Leon says this, I've sent my right hand to dispose of you. Your right hand comes off? Sal sends the actual predator to kill Leon. He freezes and blows him up. We see Sadler talking to an American sexy man somewhere on a dirty island. Leon discovers ancient Las Plagas fossils. It's very cool. Also very Jurassic Park. Leon fights two giants in an amazing boss fight where this can happen. We go on a minecart roller coaster ride from hell with multiple chainsaw men. It's very scary. We find the Pride of Lion door and key item from Devil May Cry 1. 
and finally make it to the last level of the castle section of RE4. You will not believe what happens next. Somehow in this rural ass part of Spain, this little guy commissioned or maybe forced the people of this village to build not only a giant statue of himself, but a fucking robot that can move at an ungodly speed for its size. There is a Gundam in RE4. What is happening? It chases you and then falls into an abyss. What are the costs and logistics of creating this thing? Was it all worth it, seeing it fall into the infinite unknown? This moment has lived in my mind ever since 2005. I can't wrap my head around how any of this works, or how it even got here. <sighs> Getting into Salazar's Tower of Death, the little guy explains how Ashley's been taken away to the Illuminados base on a remote island, very far away. Leon is like the cheekiest RE protagonist ever at this point, as he interrupts Sadler by doing this. It's terrorism. Isn't that a popular word these days? Not to worry. We've prepared a special ritual for you. What a bastard. Poor little evil Napoleon, he didn't deserve that. Okay, maybe he did. Ascending the tower, Leon's greeted with Salazar fusing with his left-hand man. The following boss fight is really well designed, with multiple floors and basic enemies littering the room. But instead of actually fighting this thing, we choose to stomp on this tiny bug with a well-placed rocket to the face. Later, loser. As Leon gets back down to the ground floor, Ada awaits our hero. Need a ride, handsome? <laughs> okay. Got some business to take care of. See you later. Women. On the island, the horror aspect of RE4 completely vanishes. Well, except for one part. You know how most early RE titles borrow visuals from classic action movies like Top Gun, Rambo, or Commando? Well, the island is just Commando. Leon has to hold nothing back in this place. The third and final faction of Ganado are the soldiers of Sadler's private army. These guys use equipment like stun rods, shields, and guns. You'll be fighting a lot of Mad Max rejects on this <laughs> very disgusting island. Sadler also communicates with Leon directly now, which is great because he often insults the old fucker right to his face. Just because you killed my small time subordinate. Sadler, you're small time. Oh. <laughs> After breaking through the island's line of defense, Leon enters a building housing a very makeshift-looking lab. Pretty quickly, we find Ashley being held in a prison cell via security camera. Heading deeper into the lab, we come across something very dark. As soon as I entered this room and noticed the camera was really tight behind Leon, I knew something was up. Through a window, we can see a horrifying creature laid out. Picking up a security card, a loud bang and heavy breathing can be heard behind us. This is a regenerator. The name says it all. No matter how much you damage these things, they'll regenerate their lost limbs. The lab is filled with these guys, but not everything is doom and gloom. You can find an optional thermal scope that reveals the regenerator's weakness, invisible parasites attached to their bodies. This scope paired with a rifle makes short work of these abominations. Eventually we find Ashley's cell, and after taking out an upgraded mini-boss version of a regenerator, we get the key to free Ashley. Reunited, the two explore the lab, dodging more regenerators and taking out hordes of soldiers. Finding a massive bulldozer, Ashley decides to drive this thing in an awesome on-rails set piece. I guess Ash was moonlighting as a construction worker from Brooklyn, New York before she was kidnapped. <laughs> 
Speaking of kidnapping, Ashley is taken away again, this time by Sadler. Using his unique connection with the Plaga, he mind controls our leading lady while keeping Leon at bay. Just before Ash is taken away, Leon throws a tracking device onto her sweater. Once Leon recovers, he finds a memo written by Sadler. In it, the Lord talks about being worried about his grand plan of world domination failing. He's underestimated Leon at every turn. We've got this guy on the back foot now. We're almost there. Sadler's final gauntlet of challenges will be the ultimate test of Leon's abilities. With that said, we're being watched. they told you? You're the one who kidnapped Ashley. You got John Quick, as expected. After all, you and I both know where we come from. <laughs> Krauser, Leon's ex-partner thought to be dead, has returned. Who is Krauser? A mystery, for now. Leave Ashley out of this! Oh, I needed her to buy Sadler's trust in me. Like you, I'm American. <laughs> in the red dress. <laughs> you may be able to prolong your life, but it's not like you can escape your inevitable death, is it? So now we've got to watch our backs for a <laughs> super-powered version of Leon. What happens after this incredible knife fight is Resident Evil, the game series, for the first time ever referencing Resident Evil, the movie series. Leon has to make it through a laser-filled corridor. And if you watch the first movie, you know this won't be easy. Remember like an hour ago when I said Leon was just a normal human being? Uh, this isn't giving what it's supposed to gave. The math ain't mathin'. Oh yeah, okay, Leon, you're so cool, dude. Who am I kidding? He's amazing. As we dig deeper into this island, Leon finds a bizarre system of hanging storage containers. We also find Ashley's tracking device. In a split second, a monster breaks through a nearby wall, sending Leon flying. This creature is U3, a powerful parasitic beast locked away deep underground. This boss fight might be the scariest in the entire game. Separated into different sections, you have to hit a series of switches in the section that you're currently in of this weird container maze to open the escape hatch to get to the next area. You do this while U3 is tracking your every move. Your surroundings aren't the most spacious either. Once you reach the final area, the real monster shows itself. A giant bladed parasite erupts from its back. Escaping the cage and actually fighting the boss is great. Your target is the bladed monster, but this thing can burrow underground and cut Leon in half whenever it feels like. When we finally eliminate the creature, Leon emerges in an old forgotten ruin. He also runs into Krauser again, this time very shirtless, posing a challenge to our hero. That being, find three key items to escape these ruins. Krauser stalks you on your key hunt. The strangest but also coolest thing about this fight is that Krauser is very resistant to bullets, but your knife does so much damage. Only in this one fight, though. The game wants you to have a knife fight with this legitimate commando. Even when Krauser mutates, the game is still like, nah, get that knife out. The Krauser boss fight is the ultimate test of the game's new mechanics, using your knife to deal damage and quick time events to avoid Krauser's killer blades. 
All throughout the game, the set pieces have been throwing QTEs at you. When you meet Krauser, it's this weird QTE cutscene. And then when you finally fight him, it's a mixture of QTE and real-time gameplay. Fantastic design that combines old and new mechanics to give you a genuine challenge. With Krauser defeated, Leon makes his way to the final lab area. Ada reveals herself once again, but Leon isn't having a good time right now. As he chokes the life out of Ada, she gets the upper hand on him, knocking him out of his infected, delusional state. Ada lets Leon know that he doesn't have much time till the parasite takes over his mind completely. As the two separate, Leon finally finds Ashley and frees her, but Sadler shows up to stop them. Thankfully, Ada's here to stop him. Leon and Ashley find a giant piece of machinery that helps remove the parasites within them, with help from a file left behind by Louise. This man is seriously saving the day from beyond the grave. This is it, the final battle. At the top of an old construction site, Sadler awaits. Ada! <laughs> Better try a new trick, as that one's getting old. The American prevailing is a cliché that only happens in your Hollywood movies. Oh, Mr. Kennedy, you entertain me. To show my appreciation, I will help you awaken from your world of clichés. I'm gonna be honest, Sadler's real form is kind of disappointing, unfortunately. I'm not the biggest fan of this boss fight, which totally sucks because the build-up to this moment is burning hot levels of hype. But the fight ain't really doing it for me. Spider Sadler stomps around with exposed eyeball legs that you have to shoot in order to stun him. You can use other explosives and parts of the environment, which admittedly make the battle feel very cinematic. I just don't really like how this fight plays out. It's cool and all, but I don't know. It doesn't really hold a candle to some of the final bosses of the previous games. As Sadler recoils in pain, Ada shows up just as she did six years ago to deliver one final present. Sorry, Leon. Hand it over. Ada, you do know what this is. Hmm. Don't worry. I'll take good care of it. Ada! Gotta go. If I were you, I'd get off this island too. Here, catch. Better get a move on. See you around. Very cute. With very little time left on this island's clock, Leon and Ashley make a break for it. Finding a jet ski left behind by the lady in red, we make a truly daring escape. Dude, look at Leon's sick flips. If you're wondering, the answer is yes. This is the same ending as DMC1. You can really tell that that game was spawned from this one. Let's go home. So, uh, after you take me back to my place, how about we do some, um, overtime? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, come on, Leon. Somehow Just do it. She's hot. But Ballistics, dude. You know? Ballistics. So, who was that woman, anyway? Why do you ask? Come on, tell me. She's like a part of me I can't let go. Let's leave it at that.
RE4 has the weirdest story yet. What starts as a simple rescue mission turns into a psychotic roller coaster ride with larger than life characters that throw giant robots, parasites, bug men, and Rambo tier set pieces at our iconic rookie RPD officer turned super soldier. I love everything about the village section. I feel it's perfectly paced for what's there, but I also would have loved to see more of it. I enjoy the early dynamics of Leon meeting all of these characters as the mystery as to what's going on in this village itself builds up before our eyes. The castle is my favorite part of the game, but it does feel a bit bloated. With the sheer amount of content packed into that place, I often wonder if Mikami cut anything out of this specific version of RE4. One of the castle levels is like an hour and a half long on every casual playthrough that I do. The rate at which the set pieces and boss fights are thrown at the player in general is kinda staggering too. It's even more staggering when you realize how well it all clicks into place and rarely feels poorly designed. As much as I love the insanity of the castle, I think some of it should have been trimmed down. It's all really fun, but I wouldn't exactly be upset set if like the Salazar Gundam or the dragons or the minecart ride were cut out. The island is the shortest part of the game, but somehow feels the longest to me. I'm not the biggest fan of the island, sadly. The endless drag-out fights shave points off the enjoyability spectrum for me personally. I get that the theme of this game's enemies is that they're kind of evolving like a parasite, but it doesn't mean I have to like all of it. The first faction being villagers that look like medieval serfs, the second being a religious cult in a very perfect and gaudy castle, and the third being modern-day militia. I wish the game were wrapped back around in the third act, returning to the village instead of going to the island. Seeing it destroyed and having the surrounding forests be explorable would have kept the darker horror tone in check better, I think. They could have added the island bosses and monsters to this hypothetical village area with little problem. How much scarier would it be if you saw or even heard a regenerator off in the dark woods? Imagine Spider Sadler in that opening town square area surrounded by the corpses of the people he's indoctrinated. He's all alone facing off against Leon in the shambles of a cult he tried so desperately to resurrect. Instead of being on top of a construction site, it's really weird placement. I guess it's cool how most of the story concepts of 3.5 still kind of make it into this game, but cranked up to 11. Leon's still infected, he has to escort a young girl around a castle, enemies that thrive in darkness are weak against light, and there's a dog that can help you. Granted, only in one fight, but he's still there. Another thing I'm not too hot on is the way the story plays out. I love it for how cinematic it all feels. It really feels like you're watching a stretched out action movie at times. But a lot of character motivations for the villains are exclusive to files. I wish some of that stuff was explored through cutscenes. I'm sure you all noticed me reading the files in my recap. It's because what's there is good. It helps flesh out the villains so much more than the cutscenes do. If you never read a single file in this game, all three main villains come off very one note, and I think that kind of sucks. For all the weakness in this title's story, there's no denying what's here is amazingly fun. From the locations, bosses, characters, weapons, all of it is memorable. Leon is way too iconic. The amount of top tier one-liners spat out by this guy is legendary. His look and upgraded confident attitude have cemented this version of the character as the best Leon for a lot of fans. For as amazing as Leon's voice actor, Paul Mercier, is in this title, I would have loved to hear Paul Haddad's take on this more experienced version of the character. It's really unfortunate that he couldn't return for this game due to circumstances outside of his control, but it's one of those things where I hear Ada's original actress, Sally Cahill, reprising her role in this game, and it makes me wonder what it'd be like if we had a consistent Leon for RE4. No matter what small issues I have with this game, I can't lie. I mostly just love it. It's a damn near perfect action game that I've replayed countless times over the years. Speaking of that, we've got to talk about RE4's replayability. Like any classic RE title, RE4 has a plethora of unlocks to sink your teeth into. The hard as nails professional difficulty, costumes, super weapons, bonus game modes like Assignment Ada and the arcade action mode of the Mercenaries, and New Game Plus. NG Plus is amazing. Using a round clear system, you're able to seamlessly replay the game with all of Leon's equipment, money, and leftover treasures. You can absolutely slaughter this game after a few finished rounds. The infinite rocket launcher is back and is as devastatingly satisfying as it always is. One of the unlockable weapons is the fully upgraded VP70, aka the Matilda from RE2 Classic. 
Pairing this gun with Leon's unlockable RPD uniform serves as a beautiful blast from the past while you blast everyone's ass in NG+. Assignment Ada is a fun little 30-minute distraction. I don't believe this mode is supposed to be canon to the game's story, since Ada fights a completely alive Saddler at the end of it while wearing a badass tactical outfit. The goal of this game is to find Plaga samples for Wesker. After clearing this mode, you unlock the infinite machine gun, the Chicago Typewriter, which is so much fun to let loose with. We'll talk about this gun again in just a moment. Assignment Ada's credits end with a piece of really cool jazz music, and when you listen to the whole song, you can watch the credits again, but it plays another piece of cool jazz music. I don't know why they did this, but I think it's really cool. Professional difficulty is the way I like to play RE4, but I will admit that it doesn't really offer any unique unlocks out of the gate, which kind of sucks. It would have been so awesome to earn a super secret unlockable for finishing this mode, but there's nothing. Why not give me like a big booty Ashley costume or something? Oh my god, did I just say that out loud? I can't tell you how much time I've lost to the mercenaries. This arcade-style shooter is almost nothing like RE3's mercenaries. No longer are you saving civilians, taking out enemies, earning points added to your timer, and trekking across a wide area of the game. This time you're up against waves of enemies in a small set map. You can collect time extensions to keep the murder going. This mode is insanely addictive with its own unlockables. Getting four stars on a stage unlocks a whole new character, there being five in total. Each character plays very differently from one another, and mastering each loadout is basically a full game in itself. Five star every map with every single character, and you'll unlock the Hand Cannon, the most powerful weapon in the game. The base version of RE4 has so much replayability with everything I just ran through, but believe it or not, it got even more official content through its variety of re-releases. Hi there. Sorry, I was just preparing my picnic with Leon. Did you know that Resident Evil 4 has been ported across a wide variety of platforms? I own Resident Evil 4 on GameCube. Resident Evil 4 on GameCube in Japanese. The box is so cute. Resident Evil 4 on PS2. The Ubisoft port of Resident Evil 4 for PC. This version is dog shit. Resident Evil 4 on the Wii. Arguably the greatest version of Resident Evil 4. Resident Evil 4 on the Wii in Japanese. Still, arguably the greatest port of Resident Evil 4. The PS3 version of Resident Evil 4, which I happen to like a lot. I'm kind of biased when it comes to the DualShock 3. I love that little controller. Resident Evil 4 on PS4 is a little janky. We'll talk about it. Resident Evil 4 on PS4 in Japanese is a little less janky. But yeah, we'll talk about it. I even own Resident Evil 4 on Xbox One. Fun fact, I do not own an Xbox One. <laughs> I've also got Resident Evil 4 on the Switch. Look at Leon, he's so cute. Oh my god, he's saving me. That's me right there. Saving me. I'm not too proud about this one, guys. But I also own Resident Evil 4 on this thing. It's amazing. Take my Zuck bucks. I don't care anymore. Only nine months after RE4's initial GameCube release is when we'd get RE4 PS2, a heavily downgraded but feature-rich version of the game. RE4 PS2 looks considerably worse than its Nintendo counterpart. Textures are muddy, sound quality is severely reduced, and worst of all, every single cutscene is pre-rendered. Say goodbye to your precious unlockable costumes showing up in the cutscenes. On the brighter side of things, this port includes all of the GameCube's content, plus a new super weapon, the Parasite Removal Laser, which you unlock by completing Professional. See, this is what I'm talking about. This thing fires a very focused beam, one-shotting any creature it touches. As long as you can charge this thing up all the way, it'll kill. It's one of my favorite RE unlockable weapons, and the perfect reward for conquering the hardest difficulty. There are two new costumes for Leon and Ash, which are a Mafia boss for Leon and a full medieval suit of armor for Ashley. This costume makes her completely invincible. No enemies can damage or grab her. It makes professional difficulty mode very easy. When pairing the mob boss outfit with the Chicago typewriter, Leon's reload animation changes. If you do this five different times in a single battle, Leon will do this. 
Yes, that is the best thing I've ever seen, and I don't want to hear any of your comments about it. The most notable addition to RE4 PS2 is the full side story separate ways. In this expansion, we get to see RE4 from Ada's perspective. It's very reminiscent of an RE2 style B scenario. Separate ways is extremely fun and a treat for Ada fans. Seeing Leon run around off in the distance while in control of Ada gives me kind of a sweet feeling knowing Ada was right beside Leon the whole time. She wouldn't ever let him die. Separate Ways gives us a lot of backstory as to what's going on behind the scenes in the village. We learn more about Las Plagas, how Sadler uses his unique abilities to control the villagers, we get to see that Ada was in fact working with Luis in some capacity, the big cheese was right, and we even get to save Leon a few times. Did you know that Ada was the one to ring the church bell stopping the assault on Leon? When it comes to the variety of content in Separate Ways, you are mostly playing through remixed versions of levels from Leon's game. For the most part, you'll be trekking through familiar territory. Look at this guy, he stole Leon's jacket, so that's where it went. The next big update for RE4 was its Nintendo Wii port. This version of the game includes all of the PS2 content while using the graphics and sound from the original GameCube release. The biggest draw here is the game's motion control. Using the Wiimote to aim and execute quicktime events works like a charm. You'll be effortlessly gunslinging with beyond pinpoint accuracy and control. A lot of fans consider this version of RE4 the best, and I tend to agree with them. Having all the bonus content in a graphically correct version of the game with superior control just can't be beat. A few years after this amazing port's release, we would start getting modern HD versions of RE4. The first few came out for the PS3 and 360. Both were great. The Ultimate HD PC version is also fantastic and moddable. Very, very moddable. This was the first 60 FPS port of RE4, and seeing the game run this smoothly was amazing after playing through four other versions that all ran at 30 FPS. The PS4 and Xbox One ports came later, and while I've only played the PS4 port, it seems to run pretty similarly to the UHD version, with a few minor visual bugs. On multiple past playthroughs, I get missing blood effects and strange texture jittering. Parts of the environment would also fidget around on PS4 during certain cutscenes. The overflow grid in Leon's inventory also never appears for me for some reason. It's just the grid itself, so when you have extra items, they're just floating on top of Leon's face, which looks pretty bad in my opinion. That bug aside, the other stuff rarely happened, but when it did, it could get distracting. The UHD PC port is probably the best you're gonna get for a modern RE4. It doesn't have many visual glitches as far as I can tell. I mean, it's all RE4. You're getting a badass legendary game no matter which version you play. Oh, it's also worth mentioning, very interesting little tidbit that I discovered recently. The PRL functions differently in the modern ports. This very focused singular laser rifle now becomes a kill everything button in the later ports. This thing literally hits every interactable on screen, which makes it beyond overpowered. The blue charging screen effect from RE4 PS2 was sadly removed, which kinda sucks, but you know, whatever, that's a me problem. A few very interesting ports floating around are the mobile versions of RE4, and I'm not talking about the excellent Switch port. Back in 2009, RE4 was released on something called a Zebo, which is a home console that plays phone games. This version of RE4 is half the full game, and looks very strange. The Ganados are blue, very Smurf-like. After this port came out, an iPhone version released, which I happen to own, but can't download anymore due to it being removed from the Apple App Store. I used to play this game on the train going to work, and yeah, it was bizarre. The game looks fairly close to the Zebo version, that being a PS1 game in its presentation. There's a fantastic video on these specific ports by fellow YouTuber Stop Skeletons From Fighting. I highly recommend you check out that video if you want to learn more about these bizarre versions of RE4. There will be a link in the description. The latest and greatest version of RE4 is its phenomenal VR port. I was kind of a hater of this game when I found out it was locked behind a Facebook Oculus paywall. Well, that isn't really the case, currently. And after playing the game on my friend's Quest 2, my life was changed. Again. 
As someone who's played RE4 a million and a half times, I never thought I'd be inside the world of RE4. RE4 VR is the entire Leon campaign from start to finish. Every single area of the game is lovingly recreated, thousands of textures were repainted, and parts of levels have been adjusted for VR use. A lot of puzzles were redesigned to take advantage of this new perspective. Having to physically move things around with your hands was something I wasn't ready for. And it's probably a good time to mention that RE4 VR was the very first VR game I have ever played. What a perfect first experience for yours truly. In VR, you can push RE4 to boundaries never thought possible in the base game or any of the previous ports. Want to accurately aim down the sights of the Silver Ghost instead of using the laser sighting? Do it. Want to feel what it's like to face down Dr. Salvador at eye level? You can do that too, I don't know why. I'll keep my distance. Want to dual wield the pistol and TMP like it's mother flippin' Halo 3? The power is yours. Just don't put your hands anywhere near Ashley or you'll lose them, literally. I was a little too excited meeting Ashley in the virtual world for the first time. Hello, Ashley. I just have one question for you. Can I offer you an egg in these trying times? <coughs> I can't, I can't believe this is, oh, hi. hi. Oh, hi, how are you? Hello. This is so cuckoo. This is, this is insane. Look at her little bracelet. Oh my god, what the hell? What? I'm not looking at anything. What are you what are you what are you looking at, huh? The Ashley chapter in VR elevated this short scenario to heights I wasn't expecting. It was fantastic having to actually grab your flashlight and aim it around in the darkness. So much atmosphere and immersion added to this little set piece. Fighting guys like Verdugo and the Giants are noticeable upgrades in the tension and horror departments, but nothing comes close to how well Del Lago's fight was redesigned here. This time you use a harpoon gun instead of throwing the spears by hand. You could do crazy stuff like speed loading the spears into the gun and also shooting Del Lago while it's submerged. It's so innovative and fun to experience. RE4 VR feels like a new game. It's insane. If you haven't played any VR games yet, try this one out. It's a perfect starting point in my opinion, and an amazing way to play RE4. I can talk about this phenomenal game all day. RE4 is a triumphant moment in gaming history. I know it's not like the games that came before it, or even survival horror, but that'll never take away the impact it's had on the games industry and its fans. If you haven't played it yet, you've got more than enough options at your disposal. If you're a big classic survival horror player and somehow haven't tried this game out but are interested in it, go into it not expecting a survival horror Resident Evil. This is an action game. Never let anyone tell you otherwise. It's also a journey that will most likely leave you stunned for all the right reasons. And also no doubt captivated with its brilliant, beyond well-designed polish and innovative charm. Man, I love RE4 so much. It's a game that changed Resident Evil while revolutionizing the entire gaming industry. Like I said at the start of this video, RE4 means a lot to me. Not only was Resident Evil changing and the games industry, but I was changing too. I had my first real job when RE4 came out. I bought this game with my own money, which didn't always happen back in the day. A lot of the classic RE games that I got on release were gifts. RE4 is a very formative game for me that will always have a special place in my heart. It truly is the game that changed everything. Now if you'll excuse me, I have a Leon to save. I have to be quick about it, because I don't do overtime. Sheesh, that was one hell of a video. Who could it be this time? Hello? Dino Crisis sucks! Uh, Alex? Is that you? It's Susie. 
Yeah. Uh, isn't this Jaw Muncher? No, it's it's not Jaw Muncher. Oh. Oops. <laughs> okay. Bye. Doesn't that guy have another book to write?